The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I got a call from Gary Horton, who is in um, Dallas, Texas. He said to have special prayer for him tonight um, for open doors, <coughs> boldness, and to be able to encourage um, doctrinal grace believers. Um, and it's about stete. You know what stete means? Means to stand firm. And I, I want to show you where it's found. And, and Gary requested this. That's one of his that's one of his favorite one of his favorite words out of the Greek. It comes from histomy. This is just for our prayer time. I don't want my pen. This is a brand new pen too. Um, it comes from histomy. I know you can't H. I S T E M I, histomy. It's a, a perfect, this is, histomy is the verb, and this is a form of that verb in the imperative. That's an imperative. I want to show you, I want to show you where this word is used three times, um, and, and this has to do with uh, Horton's prayer request. Uh, if, you'll, if you'll look in your Bibles to Ephesians, the sixth chapter in the uh, warfare passage, this word is used. It's used two times in the infinitive and one time in the imperative, and the imperative is where you get stete. You're, you're probably familiar with that word. It means In combat, it means to hold the line and don't retreat. That's the concept. Uh, Ephesians, the sixth chapter, uh, we start up there, you know, about verse 11. Uh, this word is used in verse 11 and 13 in the infinitive, which means it's setting up a doctrinal principle. It's used, in a, a pre, it's used as a present, uh, it's used as an aorist infinitive, and then it's going to come back to an aorist imperative. In verse 11, put on, the, and you'll see this, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm. Now, it's in the infinitive mood. It's the aorist infinitive, which means that we're talking about a doctrinal principle of spiritual warfare. It's found again in verse 13. And then in verse 12 says, this is our struggle, right? Here, here's, our, here's who we're fighting. And then verse 13, therefore, uh, take up the full armor of God. See, the, uh, it's all about armor and, and, and who we're fighting. Uh, that you may be able to resist... Uh, evil in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Now, these are aorist infinitives, which are doctrinal principles of warfare. Are you with me? And here's Horton's request. He's requesting stete. He understands the principle of spiritual warfare, and he is, his boots are, are on the field of combat. And what he's asking us to pray for is that he... Not give ground. That he stand firm in a warfare. Now watch verse 14 because once you see this verse, you'll see what's opening up. Now put on the warfare and fight. So look at verse 14. Stand firm. That's your aorist active imperative, second person plural. Stand firm. And then he tells, and now look what we're doing. We're putting on the armor. See that? All the way from 14 down. Now we're putting on the armor to fight. We're through, we're through training, right? We're, we're, go, we're all through training. We're combat ready, and, uh, and we've hit the runway, and our boots have hit, the, have hit the field. And this is the word stete. That is histomy in the imperative. That's an aorist imperative. It's stete. So he says, look, I understand the warfare. My boots are on the field. I've got the armor on. I'm in combat. 
pray for me, pray stete for me. All right, you, do you have that? Uh, uh, you, you could add to that scripture 1 Timothy 6.12, which tells us to fight the good fight of faith, and that's what he wants to do. And pray that he would not retreat. Uh, uh, 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. And that's what he wants to do. His, beats are, his boots are on the field. He's, he's equipped to do it. He's ready to fight. Pray that he not retreat, that he not back down, that he be not ashamed of the gospel, that he be bold with the gospel, that he would not back down on, on any doctrines that are important to why Christ came and died on the cross and was buried and raised from the dead. So we'll certainly do that, Gary Horton. Let's have prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin. That's because you can't study the Bible in carnality. The evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. These must be confessed in silence and privacy part of study to get the benefit of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, uh, to teach you the truth of the Word of God that sets you free from the cosmic system of lies against the truth of the Word of God. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. That's the application of the priesthood of the believer, the church age believer, out of 1 Peter 2. And this classroom etiquette is true for us that are here tonight, as well as those who are visiting us by the internet. We expect the same courtesy of classroom etiquette. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight. For these that have come our way, both by automobile and by internet, we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God about missionary evangelism, which is our subject. One of our warriors has called in for, for um, backup. We'll certainly pray to God the Father who will bombard you do everything logistically necessary for that warrior to fight and win, fight the good fight of faith. The victory is already there, but the fight is his. He knows that. He's just asking for the support team to pray, and so we lift that before you in Dallas. I pray, Father, tonight for this study in missionary evangelism that we would take a look at the Athenian heathenism, how it is arrived at, and how we would re recognize it in America, both on an individual and a collective basis, such as a nation or a community or a state. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> We're in uh, our passage of study is Acts 17. We're looking at verses uh, 31 to 34. We, we have, this. I think this is our third lesson out of Athens on Paul's second missionary trip. And <clears throat> he uh, has left his team in Macedonia, and he's been, quote, run out of town. And he's gone over to Achaia. And he's gone to uh, the city called Athens to wait on the team to come. And so he's in a delay pattern. And a, a delay pattern on the mission field means that you still have the responsibility as a missionary. And so he takes that responsibility. And we've discussed that. Uh, we've discussed his layover in Athens and how he ministered to Athens in what we might call a layover, waiting on the team to move forward. And... <clears throat> We've talked about his, his missionary work at Athens on his layover in um, the marketplace as well as the synagogue. And out of the marketplace, he was invited to come to speak at Mars Hill. That would be the intellectuals. Uh, and he has gone, and we have studied his sermon. One of, the, one of the things you always pay attention to is when God records a whole sermon, you pay attention to it. Especially, especially teachers. I mean, every time I want one, I just go nuts over it because I like, look, if God says this is a good sermon, I need to pay attention to it, right? But it's good enough to put in it. So I pay attention to them. Uh, 
So we have a full sermon and the results. We know how, what led, to, led up to this sermon, why he preached it, and what the results was of it. So it's, it's a unique, and when you see it, you should pay special attention to it because, I mean, well, anyhow. Um, in verse 31 through 34, we're, we're at the end of his sermon. He's wrapping it up, and then we see a results from his sermon. And he, we, we, we studied this about the times of ignorance. Remember, we studied that last time, I believe. Uh, and he goes on to say that God is, and he, and he talks about declaring uh, men everywhere to repent. And he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through the man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising that man from the dead. Of course, that man, Jesus Christ. So he, he has declared the gospel to him before he's going back over it. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, it says, and, 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 and see, he doesn't, it's just talking through it, uh, raising him from the dead in verse 31. But they understood he preached the resurrect, he preached death on the cross and the resurrect down in the marketplace. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, watch, watch the reaction. Watch the reaction. No, this is that Matthew 13 that we talked about the other day. Matthew 13, you know, the parable of the sower talks about the different hearers. Well, you have some of them here. Um, some sneered the, or mocked. That's, that's, that, that's that 1 Corinthians uh, 1 and 2, you know, where the gospel is foolishness to some who are perishing. Uh, others said, we'd like to hear again. We'd like to hear more. Another group uh, joined him and believed. That's nice, huh? Now, what about, I mean, we understand why we went when somebody gets saved. But what about the others that didn't? See, listen, here's what Paul says. I'm, we'll do this tonight, but here's Paul's mind. I'm here because there is positive volition at God consciousness or I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here in the sense of a layover and there's interest. I mean, I've, I've, I've been out talking to people about the gospel of Christ and there's interest here. If there's interest at God consciousness, then you're, you're required to give gospel. I mean, I mean that's why now, whoo, I got somebody that's interested in listening to me talk about God and Jesus Christ, the gospel, boom. I mean, Paul don't have to say, I guess you're God conscious. He knows that. <coughs> he wouldn't be there. You understand? You will tonight. He wouldn't be there. So he gives them gospel. And listen, some are going to believe right some are not you know and this is why you always connect judgment to the gospel that's why you always do it and, and he did it didn't he listen listen to verse 31 again and he has a uh, 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 he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness to the man who died on the cross who was buried and raised from the dead right you're going to be based on his righteousness you rejected his righteousness God don't accept yours. He only accepts his. Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Athenian heathens. I mean, how, do, how do you become a heathen? You're not born that way. You're born an Adam, but you're not a heathen. You're a sinner. They said it's worse to be a heathen than it is to be a sinner. Because the heathen tells you what, what, where their mind is. Okay? Now, what is interesting about this word in the Greek language, ethnos, it's where you get the word ethnic in English. Uh, it's you, this word is usually translated in the English Bible as Gentile in the New Testament. Vines, in his little dictionary of Greek, Greek and Hebrew words, he defines ethnos as a multitude of people of the same nature and genus which is birth or race a nation and people 
Webster, I always go to Webster and listen to him talk a little bit about English words. He defines heathenism <clears throat> really interesting to me. This is not an old one either. All right. He defines it, this is Webster, he defines it as an unconverted member of a people or nation that does not acknowledge the God of the Bible. Well, he's been to church. Webster could have well went to ours. Now, let me give you a theological definition on top of your paper. <clears throat> the theological definition has got to include the idea of rejection either at God consciousness or at gospel hearing to become a heathen. Now, you could become a heathen because you became God conscious and you gave it up to uh, worship a tadpole. Uh, what are these little things that run around your house and you call the exterminator to get them? It, it wouldn't be a road, so would it? It might be a tadpole, but it wouldn't be a roadside worship. I mean, I mean that's, those buggers, you just have to kill them. And, you know, I have the most interesting family. And during our Sunday meal, we got in a conversation. Did you know that the life of a roach, that he has a life system on both ends of him? Yeah, well, how about that? Should be at my lunch on Sunday. <laughs> you can see the teenage girls in this discussion at lunch going like, ugh. And the rest of us going, really? Because we have Terry, Bill's wife. This is, her, she's a science teacher. And so she lives for these moments with kids. And apparently adults. Well, anyhow, that, that didn't cost anything. In 2 Thessalonians 1.8, on your paper I wrote, it says, De God dealing out retribution to those. Now watch the those. <laughs> it, it, you can circle the word those because it's going to say twice. Watch this now. Those who do not know God... And I'll come back to that. And to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. How about that? See, you can fall into heathenism by either of these two acts. Now, let's go back to do not know. See the word me? Put a line above the E because that makes that long. That's... That's not. That's the word not. There's also a word not, which is ook. That's a strong one. This not is not the subject. This not is not what you focus on. But it's there to tell you not. Those who do not know, and it's the word oida. Now, here's what's interesting about oida. I know you, this is what you live for, these moments. Oida is the perfect tense of horeo. But it became such a strong doctrinal term, used in, in strong doctrinal ter terms, that it became a word in itself. Oida. Often you look this word up, it'll be oida. If, it, if you have a good lexicon, it'll tell you that the root, right guys, the root is horeo, means to see. Horeo. It's just an interesting word, and those who've gone through our Greek class know how, how proud I am of oida, and I talk about it. Oida. Now, it doesn't surprise us then that this is a perfect participle, right? It's a dative plural masculine. Those who do not know God, and the perfect tense means at some point they shut down on it and they're going to remain that way 
and they're, they're, they're toast. How about that? And listen, Athens was full of these people. You would, might think this would be the most unlikely place to go ever. But it was a layover for Paul, and Paul thought he'd check them out. And listen, there was positive volition there. Who would have known? You never know when your plane sets down or your boat <laughs> docks for a repair or something. Yeah? You on your mission trip, you may have been on the only place that would be successful for you. How about that? Well, who knows? Just saying. Now, this perfect tense, oida, has a theology behind it out of Romans 1, 18 through 32. It's on your paper. Let me tell you, the, the doctrine behind this word oida in the perfect tense used in this passage is discussed in detail by Paul in Romans 1, 18 through 32. Well worth your time to look at as he describes this. Here's the second thing that's interesting. See the word and? Now, in the English, we've just passed over that without a whole lot of thought. But in the Greek language, conjunctions can be awfully important. This is what we call in the Greek language an adjunctive conjunction. You don't have to pay extra for any of this stuff. This is this is just because you came tonight. And when you have one of these, it means that there's two things that are connected with each other that are very important to the subject. In this case, it's two participles. Now watch this. Do not know, notice that's a participle. That PTC, that's participle. Now look down, and to those who do not obey, look at, that's a present active participle. A a conjunctive conjunction, an adjunctive conjunction, connects two things. It could be nouns, it could be verbs, it could be participles, it could be prepositional phrases, it could be a lot of different. But when it's there, well, you pay attention to it. Because we're talking about the two things that drop you into heathenism. Rejecting of God, where in your soul, God goes like, oh, okay, we're done. Paul in the, listen to me now, Paul in Romans, the first chapter, is going to tell you how that process works. What would bring God? Because, you know, there was a time in my life, I don't believe in God. And then I got pretty fancy with it because I, I could find out, I would say, I am an atheist, and that would run off weak Christians. They would come up and start with that gospel, so I'd hand me a track and do some things, and I'd go, I'm an atheist, I won't need that. And, and they just, they'll go, oh, they get all flustered, and I found out they would leave me alone. I wasn't one. When I found somebody that grabbed a hold of me and wouldn't let me lose, I was in trouble. Well, I've been looking for you. <laughs> I've been looking for you. I've been all over this campus looking for a guy like you to have a conversation with. Let's, come on, let's have a cup of coffee on me. Listen, as a college student, anything that was on you, I was all for. <laughs> Even a cup of coffee. <laughs> but anyhow. So it, this is kind of interesting. Then we come to the word, and do not obey. We have the negative may again. Notice both times, listen, see the T-O-Y-S? Look at the T-O-S with oida, and look at the T-O-Y-S with Hupakuo, notice they're both in the dative, right? That's dative. They're both dative. Not only are they both participles, they're identical in everything going out, except one is perfect tense. The, the God, rejecting God is in the perfect tense, and not obeying the gospel is in the present tense. Hupakuo is an interesting word in itself. It's often translated in the Bible like it is here, obey, that do not obey. Hupakuo is made up of two words, hupo and then akuo. Akuo and, and hupokuo means to hear something clearly under authority. It means to hear something very clearly under authority. Now, I grew up in a family. I 
they sit around and tell you something five or six, seven, ten times. And so we learned early in our life to get it clear the first time so we didn't have to go through a whole process here that was not going to be good for us. <coughs> that day is gone, isn't it? God bless that training. <laughs> the second time I learned that, I was a kid. The second time I learned that, I got away from it. The second time I learned it was in the United States Army. Let me tell you, they were a lot tougher than my grandpa grandparents. My grandparents are tough. But my grandparents never made me go out and dig latrines because I didn't obey a command. I went through a process, but I didn't go, I don't, we didn't call them latrines, you know. Can't tell you what we called them. <laughs> but listen, I learned to listen and obey or my life was going to be, I thought, listen, this was, I was only a few, a few weeks or months into this deal, a few weeks, maybe a little longer than that. I went, I got two years in this thing. I got drafted. I got two years in this. Look, Ron, this can go good or this can really go bad. I was like, I'm going to go for the good right now think I'll go for good. I changed my whole attitude about listen clearly and do what they say. That's what this word of cool means. It's exactly what it means. It means to hear clearly under authority and obey. You know what I find? I, f I found this interesting. I'll, let me show you. R go to Romans a moment. I, I don't know where I'm running tonight. I never get through this lesson. I ain't even got point one. But anyhow, the tenth chapter. But you've already learned a lot, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, Horton got me set up. I could have spent the whole time just on that. Uh, the tenth chapter. But in our word hoopa cool, um, I got the. I don't think this is on your paper. Romans ten sixteen and seventeen. Now in the English, um, uh, you, it is the word heed. If you have an English translation, I don't know. However, they did not all heed the glad tidings. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And then he says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing. And you see that word hearing? Well, that works off that word heed. Now, that hearing means hearing. That's a cool but heed is hoopoe cool. And see, to see the connection? Well, please tell me, you see, you know, hoopoe and cool. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that interesting? And it's, um, it, it's, it's the gospel. And I'll tell you something else interesting about that passage I happen to think about. See the, the, the word for the word of Christ? See that? That's rima. That's not logos. This is not the generic word. We're talking about, we're not talking about the word in general. We're not, we're not talking about in any, we're talking about in specifics. And we use that word for categorical doctrine. Rema is used for cat, uh, R-H-E-M-A. Uh, R-H-E-M-A. That, that's a word for categorical doctrine. It's specific. If I could whistle, I can get that out. I can't whistle, so forget it. Well, anyhow. So th th that's kind of interesting the way this is all laid out. It's, uh, it's just interesting. Um, based on, the the on our theological definition, it amazes me. By the way, it don't take much to amaze me. But you can see with my conversation I've already had today, I can get amazed by at least little things scrolling. Based on the theological, it amazes me that two great cities and nations of Jesus and Paul's ministry both became classified as heathens. Isn't that interesting? I mean, Jerusalem and Israel, how do I know that? They went under the fifth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, they went under the fifth, man. 
There's no bigger sign than that. Oh, you say, how do you know that, Ron? I'll tell you in a moment. You know it. And the other one was Athens out of the Greco-Roman world. Is that not amazing? When he leaves that city, you can shake the... Listen, often the, the apostles and, and, and uh, prophets would go into a city. They would preach the gospel. They would reject it. You know what they do? What would they do? Shake. They would shake their booty. You know what would they do? Shake the dust. Right? <laughs> Well, anyhow, we we'll just see what you remember about this lesson. It would be interesting. Listen, and here's here here's here's how I think. And when Hort and I had a wonderful conversation about this today, here's how, here's how I think about: it. unless the Christian Church of America awakens to the ministry of ambassadorship and take that serious. <coughs> Take ambassadorship of the gospel of grace salvation serious. It will not be long before this great nation will be classified a heathen. And listen, it's generational. I mean, it could happen in my watch. And that would be, I'll tell you about a sad day in my soul. And so you know what? I don't try to miss any opportunity. Wish I had time to tell you about it. A preacher sitting in a booth next to me the other day. Now, I ain't going to tell you. I ain't got time. <laughs> but what a wonderful conversation we had. When he asked me, what are you studying? I was on this. And I said, come over here. Bring your stuff and come on over to this booth. Or I'll bring mine over to yours, whatever you want. He said, I'll get mine and bring it over. I thought, thank you, Jesus. He's going to teach me something today. And I'm going to teach him something today. And what a wonderful thing this will be for both of us. And it sure was. It sure was. But anyhow. So. Show you something really interesting about this thing of Israel. I mean, listen. God sent his. I mean, you're talking the big gun. God sent the big gun in to Israel, right? I mean, he sent his only begotten son to Israel, man. And to, war, to listen, to prepare them for the coming of Christ, he sent John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah. And everybody went, whoa, something's up. <laughs> I mean, he could only get a congregation out in the wilderness, and they all came to hear him. City people. <laughs> Listen. In Leviticus 26, 30. Have you got, can you find Leviticus? If, when you find it, tell me what page number it is. Leviticus. Now, you know, when I say Le Leviticus 26, you know what we're going to talk about? Five cycles of divine discipline, right? It's in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. <coughs> Oh, I didn't say a what? Just that page 179. <laughs> <laughs> Pam's got the page number. Uh, verse 30. Now, when we're in verse 30, when we're in Leviticus 26, 30, and, and this is going to be an important verse for us, when we're in there, if you don't have this marked in your Bible someplace or somewhere, I'm going to tell you where you find the fifth of the five cycles of discipline in Leviticus 26, the fifth cycle is recorded in verses 27 through 39. Therefore, when I saw Leviticus, when I thought of Leviticus 26, 30, I went to Ting. I know that's in the fifth cycle. Whoa. That's, and listen, that's uh, when the tanks roll through your city. Okay, Leviticus 26, 30. Then I will destroy your high places. I will cut down your incense altars. I will heap your remains. You know what that is? Yeah, you know what it is? Carcasses. 
You never want God to call your body a carcass. Huh? That is not a good view from the divine. And I love this old King James because, buddy, the old King James called it a carcass. And I can remember as a young believer when I read carcass, I'm familiar with carcasses. I'm a farm boy. When they die in the field, we have to bury the carcasses. Thank God we finally found, got in our machinery something that could dig because you went out there with a big old cow and dug and put her down deep because you had to plow. Hey, no wonder they put me in latrine duty. I hadn't thought of that before. I had experience. They looked at me and said, there's a farm boy that can do this. <laughs> and heap your remains on the remains of your idols. How about that? We are going to bury you on top of your idols, and we're going to put you in a depot, and we're going to view your body as a carcass. Now, you know God doesn't do that unless, you know what that is? That's the fifth cycle. You know what that is? That's heathenism. Hey, let me show you something. Now, let me show you something. Now, in, in, write this down. Did I put this on your paper? What I just said. <laughs> did I put that? No, I didn't, did I? No, oh, boy, you didn't pay any attention. You didn't write it down. I'm not going to repeat it. But you can see Calvin F. Church. But I'd write this verse down. If you're interested in this subject matter, you should write down Numbers 14, 29 through 32. Now I want you to go to Hebrews because that's another reference to carcasses that's really important. When you run down, and, and uh, how did they, how did your Bibles dis, dis, uh, say that about, they called them remains or something? What did you? Huh? Uh, and do, and, and, uh, in Leviticus? There yeah, dead bodies on the lifeless form of idols. Dead bodies. Listen, it, it's worse than that. He called them carcasses. God bless that old King James. He didn't, he didn't mess with words, did he? M mix, mince. He didn't mince words. I got hungry when I said mince. That, that's it. Are you at Hebrews? Oh, Hebrews 3rd chapter. That's what I thought you got. Hebrews, Hebrews third chapter. Oh, I just said Hebrews. I didn't say where. He, and so Hebrews third chapter. Let's see. I'm looking at verse. Well, we could look at verses 12 through um, 19, but I don't want to. <laughs> well, it's, it's a long time, and I, it's not even on your paper. It should have been, though, shouldn't it? Well, in verse 17, my King James person. We got carcass? Yeah, carcass too. Ah, well, that's right. That's a whole family, isn't it? Yep. It's called the carcass family. Yep. <laughs> whole family. Look at it. And you know what he's talking about? Verses 12 through 19, he's warning the Israelites. He's, he's warning the Israelites as well as the church. He's warning the people of the fifth is coming, right? And, and, he, and he brings a reference to the children of, of Israel in the wilderness whose carcasses fell, right? Now, this is, before, this is before they formed as a nation. See the principle being established? And whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? You know what a carcass, when you drive along the road, and you see a dead animal on the side, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, oh, I know every one of you stop and give it burial, right? Right? You don't have time because birds are on it too quick, right? I'm just saying. See, these are evidence of the concept of hedonism and how God feels about it. All right. Point number one. Point number one. Over the years of my personal ministry, one question seems to be consistently asked, or asked consistently, I guess. 
What about those who live in the remotest parts of the earth who have never heard the gospel? I ask, remote to whom? You certainly, certainly there's nothing remote uh, to a sovereign, ob omniscient God, is there? No such thing. In fact, there are no more remote places or people in the world to God than to you in your own house. In Acts 17, which we've read, 17, 26 through 27, he made from one every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. See, we're all over Genesis 10, aren't we? And he would have included languages that they, watch it, listen, and God did all this. Every nation of mankind, every, not some, not some, oh, well, these are third world countries and where are we? Well, we're at least second or first, right? Third world countries. Every nation of mankind lives on the face of the earth. Who's in charge of that? God, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, that, that, this is what's in the heart of God. This is what God's plan, the mind behind the plan, that they should seek God if perhaps they might grope. Remember, we talked about that word. It's a special word. Grope for him and find him, though he's not, what is that? Though, watch this now, though he's what? <laughs> Remote to whom? Remote to whom? Not far. Now, I don't know how that far that is, but it's for God, it ain't far, is it? In fact, you know how far it is? Close enough to touch. Grope. Now, that's it. Good, good word, not bad. One. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father through me. See, that's another way of saying it. Or to, Z to Zacchaeus, the wee little man, <coughs> for the son of man. Wouldn't you hate to, I mean, bad enough that he had his, he, he was small of stature, stature, or statue or whatever. For the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost, right? hoo -ah. Aren't you glad you was one of those that got sought and, Sought and not fought. Because of the passage, like Second Timothy, uh, like Second Peter three nine, God is not willing, right? God is not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. Because of that mind concept of God, we understand that God acts responsibly to positive volition and God consciousness to give gospel hearing wherever to whomever. Acts 10, 34, 35. I most solemnly understand now. I love that. I most, I most certainly or solemnly, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, no respecter of persons. But in every nation, the man who has a positive attitude towards God consciousness fears him and does what is right, is welcome to him. Isn't that wonderful? Welcome. Listen, positive volition and God conscious welcomes God. Positive volition at gospel hearing welcomes him. What a wonderful idea that is, people. Scripture teaches that God brings gospel to people who have positive volition at God consciousness or brings the people to the gospel. Right? He can do one or the other. Listen. How important is you to know that? Is that important for you to know? As a, you know why? Because you're an ambassador of his. God sends. God sends. You know, the key word is God sends. Listen, and I'm not just talking about foreign missions. I'm talking about home missions. I'm talking about Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Where are you going? Shopping? Be sure to be an ambassador. Where are you going? Dentist? Be sure to be an ambassador. 
Where are you going? Church. Be sure to be an ambassador. Where are you going? Be sure to be an ambassador. You know why? Because God, listen, you ain't, listen, God is sending you. For whatever reason you're going, God is sending you to be an ambassador for Christ. As you're, in fact, Matthew, in Matthew 28, when he tells you, go, 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 the going is a participle. As you're going about your business, as you go about your business. <laughs> oh, listen, we could, we could whip this thing in a heartbeat if we, listen, just everybody in this room would do that. If we just do that, be on your toes. Where are you going? Do you know God's sending you? Where are you going? I'm going to work. Do you know God's sending you? Yeah. Where are you going? You know, parents, we ask that, don't we? Where are you going? We want to know it even if they're coming back, don't we? Where are you going? Well, I probably won't see you for a month, mother. Where are you going? Yeah. Right? That's out of the unusual. Where are you going? Just wondering. Listen, I'm Paul's second marriage story. That's what we're studying, Paul's second marriage story, right? For, we've been here. <coughs> Listen to this. And he's in, a, he's in an Athens layover. Agreed? I mean, it, it, it's, watch this now. On the second missionary trip, God sent Paul to a pocket of positive volition of, of people in Asia Minor. That's where he went. While in Asia Minor, God sent Paul to a pocket of positive volition of God consciousness to Macedonia, Archaea. You remember in Acts 16? He had a vision of a man calling him to come over. <clears throat> Guess what he did? He went over. <laughs> then God sent Paul to Athens because once he got over to Macedonia, first thing you know, he got run out of town. We like your money, but we don't like your message. Right? Right? So your message has got to go. We'll keep your money, but your message has got to go and you with it. So God sends Paul to Athens. G G Paul thinks he's in a layover. It's not a layover, it's a layup. Right? It's a basketball term. <clears throat> well, in Athens, God sent Paul to the Hebrew synagogue and to the Athenian marketplace to engage with people. You understand, God is sending him. Then God sent Paul, sent Paul to Mars Hill. Right? Listen, on a layover, on a mission trip layover. <laughs> Took up a whole chapter in the Bible. And out of that, some sneered. Some said, I'd like to talk more with you about it, and others believed. And that's the name of the game in it. Ambassadors for Christ, there it is. Three, the plan of God decrees that every generation of mankind since Adam receives God consciousness on the basis of grace. Paul talked about this in Acts, to the Athenians in Acts 17, 26, 27. You know what this is based on? Listen to me. You know why God gives everybody God consciousness? Now, you might get it from different, level, different avenues, but he's going to give it to everybody. You know why? Salim Demuth. Because of Salim Demuth. Two wonderful Hebrew words that means that God created man in his image according to his likeness. He didn't do anybody else in creation. Everybody else in creation is made all from men, M-I-N. As a species concept of, of reproducing a species. Not so with man. <laughs> Salim Demuth. Isn't that wonderful to say? Salim Demuth. Sounds like something you drink, doesn't it? I'll have one of those Salim Demuths. <clears throat> I'm talking about Coke, of course. Coca-Cola Coca -Cola with ice is what that is. Salim Demuth. 
In Genesis, the second, uh, that, that's Genesis 126, 27. Is that on your paper? Is it on your paper? It should be because you wrote it. Right? It should be on your paper because you wrote it. Yeah, Genesis 1, 26, 27. That's Salim Demuth, made in the image according to the likeness of God. In Genesis 2, 7, he creates man's body out of the dust of the earth. And then what's he do? Yeah. Nisha Mahaim. Nisha Mahaim. He breathes into into. The, he breathes into his nostrils the breath of lives. And you know, and what happens to man? He becomes a nephish. Man becomes a nephish. He becomes a, he becomes a living soul in the image of God. He now walks and talks in the image of God. And he can't, he can't find anybody to communicate with. And so he's whining, and so God gives him a woman. And boy, did he ever. I mean, if I do this, do you know what that means? Uh, that's a puppet. Boy, I tell you. Now, I, I, listen, that's a good thing, not a bad thing, okay? James, 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 James. <laughs> I'm gonna have to have a candy bar on the way home, you know that, don't you? Candy bar. <coughs> Positive listening at God consciousness brings the person to gospel hearing and to a decision or a choice to be saved or not to be saved. For example, on Paul's second missionary trip, while Paul was in uh, Macedonia, Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, he got thrown in jail. Now, for some people, they could get really depressed over that. Not Paul. Because God sends him. God sends him. Not, not sentence him. Sends him. And what happens in the jail? It's famous, isn't it? The Philippian jailer gets saved. You know, when you wind up someplace and you, you could sit around and whine, why did I get here? What have I, I've been a good little girl. I've been a good little boy all my life. Why am I world at? Because God sent you. What? Because God sent you. Well, he's got a strange way. I know. To people not paying attention, it's strange. Right? People paying attention is not strange. Right? Boy, I, we all know this in this church, but boy, did God teach Chuck Farmer that. And boy, did Chuck Farmer teach it to everybody else that gave him five minutes of time. <coughs> I am telling you. Positive listen, positive volition at God consciousness will not save you. Did you hear that, people on the internet? Positive volition at God consciousness will not save you. Just because you believe there is one God, it don't get you into the kingdom. But it's a good starter place. You've got to believe that Jesus Christ came into this world as the Son of God, died on a cross for your sins in your place, was buried and raised from the dead third day. You believe it, you're in. Positive volition gave you that privilege. Because God welcomes positive volition to give you gospel hearing. And when you response, he welcomes you into the family. He, he welcomes you into his family forever. <laughs> James 2.19 says, you believe in God, you believe God is one, you do well. Demons also believe. <coughs> Big deal. I mean, it's a starter. It's a starter place. It's not the finish. It's a starter place. It's a good starter place but it's not the end. When sent to the mission field, it's not necessary, listen to me, to teach positive volition at God consciousness. There's no reason to teach that. That's why you're there. They've already got that idea. What you need to teach is, it, it's not necessary to teach that God exists, but what is necessary is to teach why God exists. And it won't take you but a mission trip to learn the difference in that. 
And what they want you to tell them is why God exists and how he works because they believe that he's there. They believe that. Don't have to teach them that part. That's a waste of time and energy. Teach them why God exists and how they can connect with this awesome, mighty God. Teach his is essence in practical life application to them, and they'll get it. And listen, if you ever go to the mission field, uh, and, and I mean whether, and I, well, I'm not just talking about foreign missions, I'm talking about home missions. Listen, you're not going to run into people that, they, I mean, they got an opinion about God whether they believe it or don't believe it or whatever, they, they, they're not ignorant of it. Hmm? And most of the places we wind up, the people aren't either. But you, you should teach why God exists and how that existence is relevant to their life. That's what they want to know. When you talk about the sovereignty of God, they want to know how that works in their life. How, how does that practically work? What a wonderful thing it is to show them, isn't it? Or... That God is omniscient. How does that work? Well, it works, it works wonderfully when you understand that th that's what wrote the Bible. <laughs> or how good is the sovereignty? Well, when he gives you a command or tells you to go do something, guess, guess who's going to walk you through it and, carry, and, and be with you all the way, right? Never leave you nor forsake you. Not going to be that. All those issues are really important for you on the mission field. Uh, the, however, the primary reason you're there uh, is probably clarity of the gospel message and mechanics of salvation because you're there because you're an ambassador for Christ. That's the truth of the matter. Four. Now, for Horton, he found another thing because he winds up, and probably many of you do too, you wind up in, on a mission uh, in some kind of missionary capacity of ambassadorship, and on one hand, you're dealing with of preaching the gospel. On the other hand, you're dealing with believers that need to be encouraged. They need to be, they need to be loved on. They're, they're just struggling in their mission themselves and all that. And so what, part of his request with me in our long conversation we had today is he winds up encouraging people who encourage him as well. But there is a whole other level on the mission field as well as why you're there. On the one hand, there's another reason, confirming, uh, reassuring, uh, reconnecting with the body of Christ that are out there just slugging it out every day, like you are back here. And to have another friend come up alongside uh, of another culture, another language, another geographical location, and, and they see the reality of the sameness in Christ, the oneness, it's just, a, it's just an awesome idea. Um, and so um, I think that's really important on the mission field uh, to encourage those missionaries, encourage those Christians who are just slugging it out in some of the worst conditions ever, right? I mean, some of them are just, the, the poverty level and all of that is just overwhelming. The children that are orphans is in, and people eating out of slop, things of that nature. And... Uh, And trying to be an encouragement to people that are, are ministering and that kind of is. Uh, my final point as we leave here today is personal rejection of the truth of God consciousness or gospel hearing of grace salvation is what results in personal heathenism. And I gave you some passages. I want you to go over that on your, on your Bible time um, out, of, out of Romans 1, 18 through 32. Um, there's a great passage on, on, on biblical heathenism, and I want you to pay special attention. Um, it says God gave them over in verse 24, 26, and, tw and 32. And, and for me, there were three D words, debase, degrade, and depraved. And, and then pay attention to what they exchanged God for. There's always an exchange. When, when, there's always an exchange, either on the God side or on the gospel side. There's always an exchange. You, 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 you give up God for something else. You give up the gospel for something else. There's always an exchange made. And God notes that exchange. At the, ju at the judgment seat, that exchange is going to come back. When those books are open, that exchange... So pay attention to the exchange. 
in verse uh, 23, 25, and 27. And then when you look at these as six descriptions of heathenism, whether it's an individual nation, it might have more weight on you. Do you understand? This is a six-fold definition or a six-fold description. All right, people. Listen, just what a joy it is to teach people who come hungry to learn. This is, I can't thank you enough. You, you make every moment of my study so valuable once I'm here. And uh, just give me money. Don't give me... <laughs> I'm wallpapering. I'm wallpapering the closet right now. So give me money. So let's let's close in a word of prayer. I want you to pause for just a moment in your own life and 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 pray a prayer over your personal uh, ambassadorship. I mean, just in all your busyness, remember that God is sending you. In all of your busyness, and all your business is important. Listen, I'm not, it's all very important to your life and how you manage it and all that. But just remember that it is God that's sending you in that busyness. It is God. And always have an eye open for that opportunity. And our Father, we're thankful tonight for these of come our way to study with us by automobile or by the internet. It's my prayer that we would be good ambassadors of Jesus Christ like Paul. I mean, it was always about God's hand. It didn't matter if he was at his home base church, like at Antioch of Syria, or out, out, out on a mission. It was always about being sent by God. I mean, if he went down to Chick-fil-A in the morning, it was about God sent. I want to be that guy. I want to. I want to. I want to be that mindset. Set your mind on that, and as an ambassador for Christ, always an ambassador. What a wonderful privilege and promotion in my life, through Christ. And so I pray that upon all of us. I know that's their prayer. I know this church. May we be that. May we rescue America from themselves. We are in a self-destructive mode. And we need to rescue these people. One by one, we rescue them. I can't keep the boat from singing, but I can rescue the individuals. And that, that I can do. For I made my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him.